Hi, I'm Randy Martin with the Marcus Heart Valve Center at Piedmont Heart in Atlanta, and I'm thrilled to be joined by a colleague and a, and a good friend, Dr. Scott Lim. Scott is the director of Advanced Cardiac Valve Center of the Advanced Cardiac Valve Center at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. And Vivek, uh, my colleague also at the, with the Marcus Heart Valve Center, is co-director of the Transcatheter Valve Program. So thanks for joining me. Oh, it's an honor to be here. So Scott, um, let's start out. And Vivek, we're going to all, all interact with the two of you. What do you see as the current status of the TAVR program or initiative in, in this country? So I'll start and yeah, you hop in there. In. Transcatheter aortic valve replacement really has made its niche first in the very high risk group of Correct. patients, which has always been a little bit of a challenge, I think, for us, distinguishing patients who are older, frailer, weaker, but that we still could help by doing this right. pr less invasive procedure from the patients who are just too old, too frail, too weak to really benefit. We first put, uh, did a lot of study in that group, and I think it's really shown its validity. We've started doing the march down to lower risk strata, now to uh, high risk patients, and we're just about finishing up a trial in the intermediate risk subgroup of patients. But those are still relatively small slices of the pie of all the patients with aortic valve disease. So those lower risk patients, I think we haven't begun to touch yet. So, so um, is, it, is it effective? Does it improve quality of life? Very little mor morbidity? That's, that's really where I'm getting at. What do, we, what do we know so far? Vivek? Well, what's amazing is when you look at extremely uh, sick patients, right. so patients that are extreme risk, in the partner trial, basically what you found was a substantial and dramatic reduction in mortality at one year, and the curves kept on separating. Right. And if you look at pretty much anything that we do in medicine, the reduction in mortality is as high as pretty much anything we do. But moreover, these patients have a tremendous improvement in their quality of life. Because when you're talking about patients in their mid to late 80s, that's first and foremost uh, the thing that we want to do. We want to improve their quality of life. Right. And then as we've looked at sort of lower risk patients, we've seen that at least in partner A was just as effective as surgery. And I think when we look at the intermediate risk trials, so the patients that uh, are lower risk still, I think with advances in technology and experience and operator experience, I think we're going to see a similar finding. And this technology is going to continue to spread to more and more patients with aortic stenosis or aortic narrowing. So go ahead, you want to you want Yeah, to the other this? part of this I think we also always should consider with any te new technology is a new technology tends to be expensive. And so we have to look in the big picture, is this the right thing? And I think the answer is yes, both for our society and the individual patient because patients with aortic valve disease, if you, untreated, they're frequently in the hospital with heart failure. And then when they get their standard open aortic valve replacement procedure for the really elderly patients, they're in the hospital a long time recovering. Versus these transcatheter approaches, even though it's a newer technology that may be expensive, we've found that they can get in, get their procedure, get out of the hospital in a shorter period of time, and that they're not coming back to re be rehospitalized. So, so let me, uh, and, and, I mean, it, let me ask you this then, um, early on, problems with pacemaker, needs for pacemakers in certain of the procedures, um, stroke risk, there was a, um, and then the, the problem with the early design catheters with, and patient selection maybe, aortic insufficiency, perivalvular leak. We're making advances in all of those, is that correct? Definitely. You know, there was a concern with stroke rates early on in the partners trial. And really, that was a, a phenomenon that we saw where, in compared to open heart surgery, there was a suggestion of right. higher stroke rate. Right. But when you follow these patients out to three years, it looks like the stroke rate is similar between the two. Now, this is a first generation technology against the best surgeons in the country. Correct. So, even with that, at three years, uh, we're seeing really no significant difference. Now, we're looking at latter generation technologies. The stroke rates are even lower. Correct. In the Corval Pivotal trial, we saw lower stroke rates, uh, I think in large part due to operator experience and advances in, in, in the way we put these uh, valves in. The other so-called Achilles heel of these valves is the perivalvular leak, perivalvular leak, right. which is 
uh, when the valve, around the valve, between the valve and the native aortic root, you get leakage between the frame. Due to a lot of the calcification. Due to a lot of the calcification. Right. And we recognize that that's higher than surgically implanted valves and that it does impact not only quality of life but these patients' survival. And yet we're getting lower with advanced imaging and sizing our valves better and even technologies that have special sealing cuffs that can dramatically reduce uh, paravalvular leaks. So I think that's another aspect that's going to continue to improve. And you know, people always chew on the durability. We've got great data about you know, surgically implanted valves, but, but the durability looks pretty good with these, doesn't it? So far it does, I agree. Although I think I ha would have to sound a note of caution. Uh, we're talking about patients who are in the higher risk subgroups. When we start looking at lower risk patients, our surgical colleagues have set a very high bar that the outcomes after a standard open surgical aortic valve replacement are fantastic. And I really think that some of these technologies needs to mature, as you were just saying, in order for us to have a true head-to-head -head comparison. Yeah, and I, th I think, that, you know, it's interesting because you, you bring up two points there. One, the surgeons, uh, and we, you know, a surgical replacement of an aortic valve is a standard, well-established procedure that most surgeons can do, excellent surgeons can do with very low risk to the patient. They've also minimized their approach. So if you don't need to do a cabbage, you've got, you can do a, a smaller incision. And then there's been some data out now that says if you've got, if you're going to have a TAVR and you've also got coronary artery disease, can you do a stage procedure? In other words, can you do a, a PCI and a TAVR? I mean, so so it's, things are migrating in both directions, aren't they? Yes, and even we have uh, migration toward the surgical field, meaning there's several trials out right now where the surgeon does an open incision, cuts out the native valve, and then implants either a balloon expanded or a self-expanding right. valve in there and substantially decreases the cross clamp and pump times that way. So I think there's a lot of convergence of technologies and concepts. Well, I ask you two, two final questions. I mean, two questions that are, uh, on, on my mind. Um, cost. Cost have, have certainly been an, an issue. Cost of hospitals, practices want to get into this and everything. It's a two-part question. We're, I know that we're making uh, inroads in the cost factor by modifying the way we do this so that the costs become uh, manageable, get the patients out faster. Um, is that correct? Are we, are we making changes now so that these become uh, something that's sustainable? Absolutely. And again, you have to look at cost from different perspectives. Correct. So from, as Scott was mentioning, with the societal perspective, we have good, robust data that TAVR is cost effective okay. to society. Good. Particularly the transfemorally, that is valves that are placed through the femoral artery. It's a little bit dicier and more problematic perhaps on the level of the hospital because these valves are still pricey. And we, but I think we've recognized this as, uh, as groups of operators and hospitals that in order to be sustainable, we have to be fiscally responsible to our own institution. So I think we're better perhaps at selecting patients, at doing less uh, so-called minimalist approach, getting folks mobilized early with aggressive physical therapy. Right and engaging the family and having a very good discharge plan so that we can get folks out of the hospital. We can not only improve outcomes, but we can also improve cost. And, and it's a very hot topic in, in this. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think it, I mean, it really makes all the sense in the world. Two questions I said two a minute ago, so I really mean it. So should every medical center be doing TAVRs or should it be, as, as the technology advances, the skills advance, should we have reference centers or should we have certainly centers with a certain number have to be doing them? You know, I think that this is not a simple, straightforward, one operator procedure. Quite commonly in a TAVR procedure, there will be a surgeon, a cardiologist, a, uh, another cardiologist doing the echo imaging, uh, another physician, a cardiac anesthesiologist, and then the staff handling a, to support all of this. So we may, even on the simple tabbers, have a room full of 10, 12 people. And that kind of community in order to accomplish this, in order to get good outcomes, is not something that's available at every smaller 
community hospital. So I do think that there is validity to some degree of regionalization for this. Absolutely, I, I completely concur. The TAVR is a multidisciplinary, uh, basically a multidisciplinary treatment, and you need a heart team. And I think that is predicated on having advanced surgical support. The cardiac surgeon is essential Correct. to helping us decide who is operable, who is not operable, helping us in the procedure itself, not only with transfemoral, but with alternative access uh, approaches. And then if, God forbid, something goes wrong, our cardiac surgeon is the most essential part right. of this procedure. So this all goes along with very well. It's centers. like it's like everything in medicine, especially procedural based, whether it's surgical or intervention. You want people that function well together and they have a lot of experience, so they know what to do and when not to do what. I guess you could say that. So, so I asked both of you, put, give me a five, ten years down the line, sixty-five-year-old man or woman with significant aortic stenosis, are they going to have a TAVR or are they going to have a a surgical? What? I mean, you know, if, if you held the choice up to the patient, the patient's going to say, gee, if you can do this without operating on me, that sounds good. So 10 years from now, 60, 65-year-old person with AS. So in order to adequately answer that, one of the things I think it behooves us all is to be able to get the data so that we can sit down with our younger, healthier patients who have aortic stenosis and say, yes, I know you want a less invasive approach, but what truly is at risk of stroke or the long-term durability right. and so forth? Having said that, I still would place my bets on that probably 70 to 80 percent of all aortic stenosis in the future will have a less invasive transcatheter type approach. Seventy percent. Yes, but I still think there is a role for an open aortic valve replacement because of anatomy. Because so often with a device or device technology, it fits for about you know, three, four standard deviations of the population, but there's people who have anatomy that's too large or complex or other things that you still need to have the ability to get in there and tailor And you could have associated effect. abnormalities of the aortic valve and, I mean, of the aorta, et cetera, Absolutely. stuff like that. Vivek, what's your projection? I, I think when you're, when you're talking about that age range, you're still, it's a population that's enriched with, for example, bicuspid aortic valve Correct. disease. As you've mentioned, this goes along with aortic pathology, and truly surgery is the gold standard for treating all of these things. Our surgeons, we keep, one thing that humbles me is to really look at the numbers about surgical mortality and how incredibly low it is uh, in experienced hands and how good it is, how safe, effective, durable surgical treatment is. So I'm not so sure about the 60, 65 year old. Well, it's person. an interesting deal because you know it's, you, you want if I had a 60 or 65 year old patient who's younger than me, <laughs> you, want, you want durability with this with very low uh, morbidity, very low complications. But I, but I think there's no doubt that through you know, the tavern hands like yours or yours with your colleagues has been a game changer in, in medicine. It's probably the most dramatic thing I've seen in medicine in a long time. And I think it's stimulated us to do, to figure out new ways to treat complicated valve problems in a unique way. I think the other way it's been importantly a game changer is it's changed the nature of the collaboration, the nature of the relationship between the cardiologist and the cardiac surgeon. And truly, I, I have to credit the people involved in the original partner trial for choosing the name partner. And right. I think that that is, uh, speaks eloquently of, about that collaboration. Well, I know I've, I've watched uh, Vivek and uh, Jim Counton, who's our surgeon, that's the other co-director of the transcatheter valve program, work so closely together. And it really is, it really is a very unique situation, and it's good for the patient. You've got, you know, two colleagues that both have bring separate skills but merge skills, and it helps them out. So, listen, thank you both for joining us. Um, we could sit here all day, but I don't think we, I don't think the audience can sit here all day. So thank you all for joining us and we'll have more for you uh, coming up. Thanks. Thanks.